Welcome to Love Goes Live. My name is Mark Lepkowitz. I'm a molecular biology professor at St. Michael's College. And since quarantine, I've been making videos on COVID-19 and other science stuff for the St. Michael's community. And it's been a tradition in my classes for the last 19 years, at the end of every week, usually on Friday, but in quarantine, it seems to be on Saturday, I go over what was published in the journals uh, Nature and in the journal Science, which I have a little bit of a gray area, Science and Nature. And I chose these two journals uh, 19 years ago because they are uh, they represent everything that was published in science across all fields, and they're sort of like the Olympics of science um, journals. They, you know, to get to be published in science or nature is career making. All right. So without any further ado, let's look at what was published in Nature this week because it was a really interesting week, as it always is. Okay, here we go. Hold on to your seats in case you were wondering. Yes, the record has been broken for the largest hailstone, which was previously held by South Dakota, where a 20 centimeter a uh, piece of ice fell out of the sky during a thunderstorm. In Argentina, they now have a 23.7 centimeter. That is a big piece of hail. You would not want to be hitting the head on that, at least not without a helmet, because you might get vein damage. All right. Um, didn't see this one coming. Here we go. So it turns out in May of 2018, there was a large volcanic explosion on Kilauea in Hawaii, and they now think what the trigger was. And it was a, a, a particularly wet winter and, and spring. And as a result, that porous volcanic rock got wet. And uh, as it trickled down and it, and it hit the, the magma and you know, got hot and generated some steam, that popped the top. So who would have known? Um, extreme rainfall can trigger volcanic eruptions, at least in Hawaii, and at least once. All right, this may be the most interesting article of the entire week between both journals. And this has to do with how do we crave sugars? All right, so here's the experiment that's been done many, many times. You take mice, right? So this is being done in mammals, not in humans, um, but I think we probably behave very similarly. You take mice that, that, are, that are hydrated, okay? So they're not thirsty. And now you're gonna give them two different water bottles. One water bottle, well, three water bottles. One water bottle will have water. One water bottle will have um, sugar water. And then the third water bottle will, will have an artificial sweetener. And initially the mice will choose um, either of the two sweet water bottles over water but within 48 hours, they will completely ignore the artificial sweetener and only drink the real sugar. So somehow mice, and presumably you and me, are able to discriminate between artificial sweeteners and real sugars. All right, so here's what this experimental group did, is they removed the taste receptor, it was called the TAS family, TAS-R, um, at, at least two of them, they removed from the tongue of these mice, genetically engineered them, so they could no longer taste sugars. And then they asked, all right, now, now are they gonna choose the water or, or, or the sweeteners or can they even discriminate between them? If they can't discriminate between them, they should choose all three equally. And if they can discriminate, then they will, they will choose the sugar water again. And guess what? They chose the sugar water. So somehow they're perceiving sweetness um, and blowing off the artificial sweetener and it had nothing to do with the taste receptors in their tongue. So then they started looking down into the gut. So in the gut, you have this, this nerve, the vagus nerve, which communicates essentially what's happening in your gut to the brain so you, so you can metabolically respond to that. And you can actually inhibit the vagus nerve in mice, you would never do this in humans, um, with the tetanus toxin. So you take the tetanus toxin, you can engineer it into mice in such a way that you can flip a switch and turn off um, the vagus nerve. And so then they repeated this experiment with mice that could taste, mice that couldn't taste. And what they found was, is that the vagus nerve communicates whether there are real sugars in the gut, but not if there are artificial sugars in the gut. So what does this mean for you and me and really the public health out there? So 40 years ago, artificial sweeteners were introduced and they have not moved the needle pretty much at all on obesity um, or on sugar consumption um, in the US. And so why is that? Well, it turns out you can taste them, but your actual drive and preference from sugar comes not from your tongue, but from your gut. And your gut does not perceive those artificial sweeteners. Plus they taste terrible. All right. So that's, that's, uh, that's what we had in nature. Uh, let's move on to science. Uh, science was also interesting this week. Ooh, here we go. So Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty, as we all know, falls off the wall, can't be put back together. Um, again, all the king's horses, all the king's men, and so on. And it's, it's a terrible tale to think about it because it's, it's really the way in which we should teach children and maybe ourselves um, about uh, immortality. And you know, when you break the machine, um, sometimes you just can't fix it. So what does that have to do with this article? So this article is looking at a phenomenon called chromothripsis. And chromothripsis is when a chromosome shatters, right? Usually when a chromosome shatters, uh, that's legal, right? Like cells don't respond um, to that very well. 
but at some low frequency, the repair machinery will make a Humpty Dumpty Frankenstein chromosome. It'll put that chromosome back together almost never, actually always incorrectly. And that Frankenstein uh, chromosome, which results from this process called chromothripsis, is a driver for cancer because now you have a chromosome, you know, which is not acting properly. And as a result, um, you know, you start pushing the probabilities towards, towards that becoming an oncogenic event, not deterministic, probabilistic. So the, the, the mechanism of how chromothripsis occurs and how it's prevented was partially elucidated this, this week by a group that was looking at when cells are dividing. So or when cells are dividing, you have to copy the DNA. DNA is huge, right? So it's 10,000 times, or no, 100,000 times uh, wider than the nucleus. So you have a packaging problem. So when you package it in there and then you copy it, it's like uh, having a ball of yarn, making a copy of it, and then trying to separate the two. At some frequency, they get tangled up. And when they separate, one of those chromosomes will shatter. If it's made into a Frankenstein chromosome, that's chromothripsis, and that will push the, um, the probability towards that being an oncogenic event. Very, very interesting. They also figured out the repair me mechanism for when you can prevent it. And for those of you who are molecular genetics, it involves the ubiquitin proteolytic degradation pathway. There you go. All right, insect brains, so marvelous and so tiny. So the average insect has 135,000 neurons. That's a pretty small circuit. Um, compared to you and me, we have on average 86 billion neurons up here. All right, so, so why, why do we care? So insect brains um, are, are very small, so it's a small circuit, but they can do some remarkable things. So let's take, for example, any predator, let's take the dragonfly. So dragonfly, vicious predators, like the great white of the um, great white shark of the insect world. So it's chasing down some sort of prey, right? And as that prey moves, it dodges and weaves, the dragonfly is having to keep that prey in its line of sight and adjust its, um, its motor, motor, motor neuron response to that, okay? And so some scientists reasoned, well, if dragonflies can do that really sophisticated chasing down with only 135,000 neurons, the circuit must not be that complicated and we should be able to imitate it. So they made, are you ready for this? What do they call this? The mantis bot. So it's a praying mantis with a little bitty brain in it. Um, that, it's, a, it's a circuit actually. And uh, um, it's able to, it's, it's no dragonfly. We'll start with that. And it's no praying mantis, but it is pretty good at chasing down prey and adjusting to it. Um, with respect to motion and keeping it centered in this camera. So one step closer to Skynet. <laughs> All right, uh, hopefully not. All right, this one, and the things you'll never understand. Facebook decided they wanted to figure out what would happen if we paid people to not use Facebook for four weeks. And so, so you need some sort of incentive. And they landed on $102, not 99, not 1,000, not 500, not 100. But 102 seems to be the sweet spot. That's the whole part of this article I couldn't figure out. Why $102? Like, why is that the incentivizing point? All right, so, so they took a group of people, they disconnected from, from Facebook for $102, four weeks, and what did they learn? So the average person gains 60 minutes, an hour in their day. Um, they report being happier, they sleep better, um, they become less politically polarized, and they actually socialize more with people, primarily offline. When given a quiz though on current events, they did much poorer. And then after four weeks, they didn't return to Facebook at the, at the same frequency. Now here's the follow-up question. How much do you think Facebook is gonna pay them now to rejoin? <laughs> and how long will it take to re reestablish that addiction? Uh, who knows? All right, two more and then we'll wrap it up for the day. So there was an article, a uh, group looked at Douglas fir tree rings, which can live to be over, you know, over 1,200 years. This is out in the Southwest where they grow, and they're able to use the, the width of the tree ring to, tree ring to look at drought. Um, and so I think this isn't you know, news to anyone and that's living in the, in the Southwest, but we are in a mega drought. So for the last 19 years, it's been the second driest period in the last 1,200 years by quite a bit, um, which is not good news. Last one, so turtle, turtles and some, some fish and some other reptiles uh, actually determine the sex, their sex is determined by the temperature in the case of turtles um, of, of the eggs in the, in the nest. And uh, that's been known for a while, so, so warmer eggs produce females, cooler eggs produce males. The mechanism is now understood. So it involves um, a receptor that picks up the temperature, you have some signal transduction, but molecular geneticists wait for, wait for, it all has to do with DNA packaging. So as I said earlier, DNA is a giant molecule. It's gotta be folded up into the nucleus in such a way that actually 
are is functional. And as I've said in other Love Goes Lives, uh, where do you put your t-shirt or where do you put your sweaters in the summer? You put them in the bottom of the drawer because you don't need them. Same thing happens in you and me and ourselves. Where do you put the jeans that you're not using? You package them away because you don't need them. And so uh, it turns out that temperature drives packaging such that um, if you're going to become a female, you package away those genes that will make you a male. And if you're going to become a male, you package away those genes that will make you a female. And that is temperature driven by chromatin remodeling. All right, that's all I got for you today. Uh, as always, trying to rise from the ashes uh, like the Phoenix, letting crisis bring out the best of me. I'm going to go enjoy this beautiful Saturday. Goodbye, Friday. Bye, kids. Bye.